hands are not the problem. That's having a confidence in God.
Lord, as we do come today, we come, Lord, as an instrument of worship. I just believe that you're going to anoint the words of our mouth, these songs, the choruses, the music, Father. I believe you're going to anoint our hands, our voices, that it will cause the heart of God to be glad. And as scripture says, give God glory. You're going to take what we present to you today and build a it and turn it into glory. The atmosphere that is conducive for a king to make his appearance. Lift up your heads, all you gates, and be you lifted up, you angel by the door, that the king of glory might come in. Lord, right now we just roll out the red carpet for the king of glory. We declare this is none other than the house of God, the gateway to heaven. Step into our midst today. Be high and lifted up. Be exalted in this place. Fill this place with your glory. Let the train of your presence, that vast array, that procession of glory and worship, Lord, let heaven and earth connect together right here and make this a bit of heaven on the earth. Transform this mortar and clay, wood, stubble, God. Transform it to be a supernatural habitation for you. In Jesus' name.
paths until they are one for who am I? Would you love on him right now? I speak to every troubled mind right now in the name of the Lord. Whatever is perplexing your mind, troubling your mind and soul, I speak peace in the name of the Lord Jesus. My peace I give, not as the world gives, give I unto you. He could steal the storm or he could give you a supernatural incubation of his peace right in the midst of the battle. He could, he could wipe out the wind and the waves right now or possibly the greater miracle would be that he would stabilize you and give you a supernatural steadiness and comfort right in the midst of the storm. But regardless of how he chooses to do it, you're the apple of God's eye and you're the one. If you were the only one, Jesus would have looked down the corridors of time and seen you standing here today and would say, my child, I would do it just for you because you are the one. What great love the Father has shown us that he would send his son. Oh, won't you just love on him right now? Thank him. I just declare in the name of the Lord, whatever is troubling your mind, it's not your battle, but the battle is the Lord's in the name of the Lord Jesus. If it's been a report from the doctor, if it's been words of accusation and assault that a loved one has sent your way, if it's worry about how your marriage is going to withstand or stand up, if it's a concern for parents, whatever the situation might be, in the name of the Lord, you've got a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You cannot run him off. He would have to break his nature to break from you. That's how devoted and committed he is to you right now. Would you lift up holy hands and just love on him as we sing this? Just thank him. Thank him that he's the need beater. He's the way maker.
care. You know the need in advance. Before you had a chance to call, you were aware. But right now, there's a fresh touch, a fresh anointing. I speak to financial distress and worries in the name of the Lord. And I declare that God is putting you into a season that is more than enough. Why? Because you serve a God that is more than enough. Your anticipation has been way, way, way too low. But only believe in all things. for it right now.
So if anyone can give up some time this week, you know, it's like sowing a seed. You know, a lot of times we think sowing a seed is just monetary. No. God sees the seeds that you sow when you sacrificially give up your time. And so won't you join us this week and this coming Saturday and just help us pitch in, even if it's for an hour. Or maybe, maybe you can give two hours. Maybe you can spend the day with us. But I just petition you to, to join your family as we are, through, are going through this very exciting time. God is in the midst. Yes, we see his hand moving. And we're excited. He doesn't always show us everything all at once. Because he wants us to have faith to believe him for his best. So we just want to take an opportunity this morning as well to welcome our visitors and our guests that are joining us for the first or second time. If that is you, the ushers are going to come forward and they actually have a connection card. And if you would just slip up your hand promise we won't embarrass anyone. We just want to hand you a card, have you fill it out so we can take a uh, note of your attendance with us today. And obviously, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to pray with you and reach you immediately after service today. Thank you for joining us at Lamb Church. Touch of God got so heavy. 
And uh, but the purpose for the fasting and praying is outlined in your bulletin. But I believe that the main thing that God's put on my heart is what He wants to do for our families. Would you do me a favor? And uh, uh, aside from the uh, uh, the uh, attendance sheet that comes by, write the names of your loved ones down that you want to see God perform a miracle in their sight as it comes by. Now, ushers, it hasn't come by yet, has it? Okay. So when it comes by, uh, and make sure it doesn't stay with you. If you need to get up and pass it along to somebody else, make sure it doesn't get uh, stopped. Uh, but, but write that down. And uh, if you don't want to write their names down, write down what you're believing for. If, you, if, you, if you've got a loved one that has an addiction problem of some kind, gambling, pornography, drugs, anything, just write the, the topic down if you want to. And uh, we'll pull those off of that attendance list and we'll be laying hands and praying on those. Uh, so come this Wednesday night. We're teaching on the end times from 7 to about 8. And then we go into prayer, and God is going to honor that. Amen? Amen. Um, all right. My train jumped the track. I had a good thought coming right after that. What was it, Pastor Scott? Well, uh, all right. Come on, ushers, and give us an opportunity to minister with our time and our offering. Isn't God good? Amen. And the Bible says, he that sows sparingly will reap also sparingly. He that sows bountifully. The economics of God work in such a way that they are backwards. To go up, you have to go down. To receive, you have to give. To live, you have to die. To be forgiven, you have to forgive. Amen? And uh, here's the thing about it. When you sow seed into the kingdom of God, your supply does not diminish. You just ensure the expansion of it. So, don't turn to somebody and tell them, don't eat your seed. You don't want to eat your seed. You want to sow your seed. And uh, I remember hearing the story of a farmer that uh, years ago, they, they had it rough for years. And they finally had a good crop. And the children were excited to see the harvest come in. And they had this big pile of, of corn. And it was the best out of the pick. And the children said something to the dad about being able to, after the harvest was in, to enjoy that nice pile of corn. And he told them, no, you're not going to do that. And he said, that's the promise of your future. That's your seed. That's corn we're going to use for seed. You don't eat your seed. So prophesy and determine what your future looks like by your faithfulness to the Lord today. Father, in Jesus' name, we just speak. Declare this is a time of worship. Receive it. Jesus name.
God sanctifies every aspect of our life. It's a means whereby our faith is gauged. The level of trust that we place in you is gauged by the willingness to time. And then God worship and liberality of heart. The wisdom of how that the kingdom operates is seen in the offerings that we give. That's, the, that's where our harvest comes in, in abundance and, and in a reciprocating passion. So we sow bountifully today. We do it out of gratitude of heart, but we also do it out of obedience to the mechanics of the kingdom, knowing that this is how that increase comes. And I declare again over this congregation, debt-free living, supernatural debt-free living. This is the year of Jubilee. We're living in Jubilee himself, which is Christ. So I don't know how you will do it, but I know it's going to be done and it has been done. Be honored and glorified. And everybody said, Amen. Let's give a warm clap to our band, our neighbor. Don't forget to join us Wednesday night again for prayer. That's so important with the day and the time we're living in and God is going to honor. Turn with me, if you would, this morning to uh, the first epistle of Peter. And um, I want to uh, talk to us this morning about our faith. And hopefully get across to us this morning as well how powerful your faith is. And it might be that you're not aware of how powerful your faith is. You might compare it to somebody else's and say, boy, I wish that my faith was like Joe Lasasa or Dave Cran or Pastor Scott. But I'm going to show you in just a moment that we're all on the same ground when where our faith is concerned. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the privilege of speaking your word today. And Lord, as we do stand before you, and I want you to take this word and drive it home as a revelation to every heart, every hearer. Our minds are alert. Our bodies are strong. There are no distractions. And Lord, as we do so, we lift up before you today. Thank you for touching Janet Ward. Thank you for complete restoration for Marianne Bailey, Lord, complete. We lift up Keith uh, Stenhouse, who's in the hospital right now. Um, I think having a, a surgery, possibly even as we speak. We lift him up, oh God, and send the anointing to where he is. We also thank you for raising up and touching Carl Christensen. And this entire body with your holiness. In Jesus' name, amen. First Peter chapter 1. Out of the Amplified, I love the way that it reads out of the Amplified. And I'll, I'll begin by just asking you, how many are going through something, a challenge of some kind? Anybody? Would any of you, how many of you would say, Pastor, my faith is being tested right now? Okay. Well... Let me let me insult you then from the word, okay? Because my mercy gift and my grace gift, when I know you're going through something, I want to come up to you, put my arms around you, and say, uh, Lord, I mean, dear one, beloved, you know it's going to be all right, and just kind of soothe your emotions. But look at what Peter said. You should be exceedingly glad on this account. I'm, I'm mad at him right there. Right there. Especially when you're in the heat of the battle and you want somebody in human flesh to come and just pat you on the back and maybe let you be human for a few moments and cry. And Peter says you should be, you know, think about what you're going through. Maybe some friends that you have that are going through some real challenging things. And, and it's, it is, it sounds insulting. You should be exceedingly glad that though for a little while you may be distressed by trials and suffer temptations. Well, Peter, I, some of us might say, I haven't gotten to that point yet that I can say, oh, goody, goody, here's another trial. 
But folks, when you understand the economy of God and how that God works and why he permits those things to take place in your life, and you don't lose your confidence in the midst of the trial by beating yourself up and thinking with just your human understanding, I must have done something wrong and God is mad at me. If, you, if you'll understand that this is how God permits you and helps you to grow from one level of glory to another. It's positive resistance. It's you working against the weights to get buffed spiritually. So he says you ought to be glad so that the genuineness of of your faith may be tested. Your faith, which is infinitely more precious than the gold and the silver and the blessings that we are striving after. See, listen to this. If, if, if we asked, if, if God asked you, what would you rather have? The answer to all of the needs that you presented to me right now or the opportunity for, you, for your faith to be tested? Probably most of us would say, oh, God, absolutely. Give, let my needs be met. And Peter is saying the greater treasure is not in having your need met. But in God permitting you to go through some things so that you go to the end of yourself, the end of your means, the end of your capability, so that you're able to trust him in, in each and every situation. Let me lift it up before you again, and I believe that this was a word to me from the Lord. Uh, uh, two Wednesday nights ago, we're here Wednesday night for prayer and teaching and so forth, and Caitlin uh, calls me at a, right about 7 o'clock on the dot. I'm getting ready to step up into the uh, podium to teach, and Caitlin always texts me. She never calls me. So I knew it was unusual, and I answered the phone immediately, and she said, Dad, uh, uh, we've been in a car accident, and... Um, at that point, I kind of went numb, didn't hear much of else, what else she said. And about the same time she called in, I looked down at Mary Gay's calling me. And uh, I didn't switch over quick enough, so I lost Mary Gay's call. And then I got back to Caitlin, and they were coming north on Harlem. Uh, a drunk driver was heading south on Harlem. And uh, he just pulled right in front of them and hit them head on. And uh, so uh, I, I, my first instinct is, and I wasn't fearful or anything, I just, I, I have to be there. I've got to get there as quick as I can. So I'm 54 years old, never had a ticket in my life and plan on keeping it that way. But that night I didn't care. Pastor Scott got the car with me and we, we took off. And we made it to 158th and Harlem in record time. And when we topped the knoll at 150 at Harlem and about Wheeler, which would be 153rd thereabout, and we topped the knoll. And I saw all these lights in, uh, down in the northbound lane to the left. And I know there was at least uh, three police cars, two uh, in, uh, fire trucks, ambulances, and so forth. And so by sight, it, it was, it, it, it could, but, but there was a, a peace of God that passes all understanding. And, and you say, well, do you not feel guilty for not getting upset and, and emotional and everything? And all I, that I was aware of me was I trusted my daddy. I was so conscientious and aware of, of how great my daddy God is to do what I'm not capable of doing. If I was there, I would have been giving them the best care and, and doing how I, I would have taken care of everything for them. I would have soothed their mind. I would have embraced them. And, but, and I knew that I wasn't there, but when I saw it, I knew Daddy was there. And I couldn't worry. My, my point was I wanted to get there as quick as I can, but I trusted God implicitly. And I've been musing on that, Angie, since then, and I've, I've asked him, I said, Father, does that, is that what it means that you walk by faith and not by sight? And it is a, a matter of walking by faith and not by sight, whereby your natural senses become more desensitized to the reports that you hear, and your spiritual senses are so super heightened to the voice of God and the promises of God that the voice of God drowns out the din uh, of human intellect, reasoning, and rationale. And, and, and you walk in a perpetual peace of God that passes all understanding and you understand that if God is letting you walk into that thing and you understand the nature of Father God, 
that he says, child, this is the means that I that I used to raise you up to be mature sons and daughters of mine. You wouldn't have any other. So it's not God being mad at you. It's not God forsaking you. It's not that God is just trying to teach you a lesson. Nothing by that means. You have to, faith gives you the ability to know what the outcome is. I didn't wait to get to the car wreck to find out the condition that they were in. I saw them in my spirit. I saw, I knew they were okay. How did you know? Because I know Father God. I know that before I got to church, I had been praying in the Spirit voluminously. And, and the Holy Spirit had just been pushing intercession through me. And I'm thinking, okay, we must be really going to have a wonderful time tonight because the Spirit of the Lord is interceding. Well, no, He wasn't interceding by my teaching. He knew what was coming and He was interceding through me according to the will of God. So He dispatched angels, did everything that was necessary so that, that at the moment of need... See, I would have preferred them not having to go through that, but I knew what the outcome had to be because I knew the heart of Father God and that he can be trusted. And so Peter says it here. He says, so that the genuineness of your faith may be tested. Your faith, which is infinitely more precious than the perishable gold, which is tested in pure by fire. The Amplified Bible says, this proving of your faith, this testing of your faith, this critical analysis of your faith is intended to rebound to your praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So uh, go with me now, if you would, after we look, see how that Peter puts it, and go with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 1, and let's look at the process of how that God develops our faith and I'm not going to be long before you today, but I just hope that this is a faith-building message to encourage you. And and uh, one of the things that, that had sparked my, my thought to move in this direction the last few weeks has been uh, just the Lord driving home to me that the faith that we have is not our faith. Faith is the ability. Faith, faith is the the, the supernatural antibiotic for, that heals any and every cancer, disease, malady of any kind. Faith is a key that unlocks every single door of treasure that God has. Faith is not something that is trial and error. It, it, it is the complete antidote and answer because it's not your faith. It's Jesus' faith that was delivered to you. He's the author and the finisher of it. What's interesting about Jesus being the author and the finisher of your faith is that it, the, the word author can actually mean captain. It can be translated author, but it can also be translated just as easily captain. So he's the captain of your faith, and the captain of the ship is someone, when you get on board the ship, you're certainly not the captain. Hello? And Mary Day and Kayla and I have been able to enjoy cruises before. And one of the things that I don't give attention to once you get on the ship is how it's being driven. I understand that is none of my concern whatsoever. So faith is a grace of God, a supernatural enablement by God given to us through Jesus Christ that gives us the ability to rise to God's level as opposed to using human reasoning to bring God down to a rational level. Do you understand what I'm saying? So your faith and my faith are so supernatural that, that, it, that it never fails. It can't fail. Why? Because it's faith that, of the Lord Jesus Christ that was delivered to us. And somebody might say, well, then why in the name of God and don't I see the results of it? I'm getting ready to tell you why that's, that's the case. But when faith is properly used, it won't fail and it can't fail. And it becomes to be something along this line in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. But especially verse 2. And it says, don't be conformed to this world in this age fashioned after and adapted to the external superficial customs. But be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, 
so that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and the perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. In other words, he's saying that you're living in a fallen world, and if you're not careful, you, your mindset, your relating to this world, will, will uh, have an influence on you to where you think and live one-dimensionally. You will think like a fallen individual, a, an unregenerated individual. When in reality, you're a supernatural individual that should be living a supernatural life. But if your mind is not renewed, if that, if that new program is not put in your computer, if you don't have the latest software, then you're going to be back to the days of the Commodore and, and, and that kind of thing. And you're going to be playing uh, uh, Space Invaders. Uh, you know, do you remember how that the games used to be years ago? Some, some of y'all are too young to know it, but the, the big game back years ago was what Space Invaders and what else? Pac-Man. And Pac-Man didn't even look like a Pac-Man. It looked like just some little jumbled dots and so forth. And so now we've got to games that are so 3D and realistic that, I mean, it looks like you're playing with real humans and, and so forth. And so it, your unrenewed mind is like going back to the old days of the Commodore, the, old, the Tandy computer, and you're playing space aliens and space invaders. It's a little singular line that hits dots that bounce up and down. And, and you, you might say, well, why in the world? I can't get excited about playing a computer game like that. It's so infantile or archaic and outdated. That's it right. That's the way you'll be if you don't have a renewed mind that puts you in the realm of living on the very edge of what uh, God is doing and providing right now. Do you understand what I'm saying? Are you following me? So you have to be transformed by the entire renewal of your mind and you, uh, the, the word of God replaces. See, this isn't going to be imposed on you. God's not, you know, I love, can I pass to you just a minute? That was two of you. I love praying for you. I love laying hands on you. And believing God for miracles. But the answers of God, whether it's healing for your body or whatever, they're not just going to automatically jump on you. You can't find somebody 24-7 that's going to be around all the time that's going to either give you a word from the Lord or is going to do the spiritual warfare and, and, and the faith walk on your behalf. So, let me put it like this. Bear with me just a second. God is not going to heal you. He already has. He's not the God that was. He's not the God that I am going to be. Faith understands that God is the I am. So, if you wonder and want to have a litmus test of whether you're walking in faith and living in faith and governed by faith or not, here's the best litmus test I, I know that, that, that I can give to you. If your prayer has attached to it that God is going to do whatever it is that you need, you're not walking in faith. That's hope. Amen. But if you understand and your faith acknowledges that God has healed me, God has met my need, and you begin to act like it right now and, and rejoice right now and let your confession reflect that right now. Now you're beginning to walk in faith. Why? Because God is a father, but he's also God. And before you woke up, God knew what your uh, tasks and lists to do would be today and for the rest of your life. And while you were sleeping, God looked at your calendar and saw everything that you would ever stand in need of. And while you were asleep, God took care of every one of those things. Why? Because, see, he's the source. Uh, you don't have to worry about God being generous with you because he's already so generous with you that he's the source of your sunlight today. He's the source of your heartbeat. He's the source of your clarity of mind. He's the source of the roof over your head last night. He's the source of every good thing that you possess. He doesn't have to give it a second thought and say, I think I'm going to bless you today. That's just his nature. He's the source of every good and perfect gift. So since he has to be that way, uh, because that's his nature. He looks over the sum total of your life and saw what your needs were and said, well, I've already met them according to my riches and glory through the Son, Jesus Christ. 
you to hear what I'm saying today. And if you wait in this suspended state to wait and see for the, the manifestation of it and withhold your praise from God, you're not walking in faith. Because the demons, the Bible says, they believe God that much and they tremble. But we have a, a saving faith that is so vastly different and so powerful that, we, that he, it says, I want you to bring God into the I am because now faith is. It doesn't say now faith is going to be. But now faith is. He's the ever-present help in the time of need. It doesn't say I'm going to be your help. He's the ever-present help. Faith understands you bring God into the equation right now and God doesn't have to render a verdict since he's eternal. He's already rendered a verdict and he said in blessing I'm going to bless you and in multiplying I'm going to multiply you. He's already considered your estate and sent his word to meet your need before you were ever born. Oh, thank you, thank three of you for clapping. Do I need to say that again? I can back up and, and punt one more time. Let's look real quick, if we would, at Mark chapter 9. Real familiar verse of scripture. This is part of the reason that we're fasting today and fasting for 40 days. And if you can't fast sun up to sundown or 24 hours, the only thing that God said we don't have to fast is coffee. He gave me an absolution on that. I just had a word from him. He said, Freddie, you know, the only thing, he said, you all need coffee. He said, that's a, that's an, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but also by coffee. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm working on it, folks. I'm working on it. Before the 40 days are up, I'm, I'll be there. But uh, fast, fast what you can. But let's look at this in Mark chapter 9. And beginning with verse 17. And one of the throng replied to him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a dumb spirit. And whatever it lays hold of him so as to make him it, its own, it dashes him down and convulses him. And he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth, and he falls into a motionless stupor and is wasting away. I asked your disciples to drive it out, and they weren't able to do it. And he answered them, Oh, unbelieving generation without any faith. Now, isn't that an odd comment to make? Because Scripture says he's dealt to every man the measure of faith. So we're looking right here at, at something like a hopeless situation. It's not Lazarus type of hopelessness yet. But it's where that, that they're drawing upon genuine spiritual resources. To, to see this need met. They called upon the disciples. They've seen miracles take place. They know the ability of God. They don't have a problem with knowing and believing God is able to do this. So where, where is the, the clinch in their armor? What, 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 what is, is it that is not working? And it goes on to say um, uh, in, in verse 19, he said, Answer them, O unbelieving generation, without any faith, how long shall I have to do with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. So they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, at once it completely convulsed the boy and he fell to the ground and kept rolling about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has he had this? And he answered from the time he was just a little boy. And it's often thrown him both into the fire and into the water intending to kill him. But if you can do anything... Do have pity on us and help us. And folks, I have to say, I believe that that's where the faith of a lot of believers are. If you're able to do anything, and you have to understand, listen to this, please hear this. God cannot be, um, what would be the word that I'm looking for? Not inconsiderate, but God cannot be uh, without a reply and a response to your need. It would go against his nature. God can't just not answer you. Uh, God, it, 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 there's many, and there's many reasons. Uh, if, if nothing else, you're his child. You're the object of his love and his attention. If it's if it's consequential to you, it's consequential to him. And so, uh, 
uh, it says here in verse uh, 22, if you can do anything, have pity on us and help us. And that's, that's kind of an emotional, nice emotional place to be with your need. You can kind of feel close to God and say to God, Lord, if, if you're able, if you're able to, would you just have mercy? I mean, that's kind of soothing. You can, and, and that is not the posture that gets a response from God, Because, and I'm going to show you why. And Jesus said, you say to me, if you can do anything, why all things can be and are possible to him who believes. And so that brings me to the point of, of okay, he, he tells them that they're a faithless group of people, and, and then he tells them that all things are possible to them that believe. And if I asked you today how many of you believe God, everybody would say, I believe God. But let me show you what the difference is. They all had faith, but when he said that they were unbelieving and that all things were possible if they believed, it is a matter, listen to this, I, I hope you don't think that this is a glib little statement. The point of the matter is those that are willing to engage their faith in getting what they need from God. Believing is an act of the will, the same as unbelief is an act of the will. And unbelief is the, the individual just simply saying, I will not engage my faith in, in receiving this from God. So if you ask me today, what's more prevalent in a lot of uh, churches and a lot of believers' lives today, faith or unbelief? I'd have to say unbelief because it's the absence of, of us engaging our faith to receive what we need from God. And so it could be that God is saying to every one of us, oh, I'm willing and I'm able. But I'm not going to do it because you're full of unbelief. And unbelief is an act of the will where we just kind of settle down under the circumstance and think that God is just going to come and rescue us. Well, He wants to rescue you, but He does it a certain way because the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. You have faith. I have faith. Matter of fact, I'll go so far as to tell you we have the same faith. It's the faith that has been given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher, the developer of our faith. So it has all of the potential in the world, but the problem that faces so many believers is the issue of unbelief, where we choose not to engage our thinking and our conversation in a holy and a spiritual fashion that, 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 that bespeaks that we're living and walking and talking and thinking by faith. Are you following me today? If some of you from this moment fall, I'll say that to everybody that needs a healing in your body from the Lord, if you would this day get out of unbelief and say, God, from this very moment forward, say, begin to thank God that he healed you by the stripes of Jesus 2,000 years ago, you're moving out of unbelief and you're starting to walk into faith because the Bible says that from the abundance of the heart, the man's, the mouth speaks. And so believing God originates in the heart. And, and we're told in Scripture to and a prayer to God, God, pull out of me any, anything in my heart that is a matter of unbelief. And if you replace what's in the heart, replace the unbelief with faith, then it has to come out of your mouth. And if you believe that God knew your need before you ever had the need, and you believe the integrity of His Word in His person, you don't have to govern your faith and your life by what you see because faith is greater than fact. A fact is temporary, but faith is eternal. And if you would begin this very day to confess out loud uh, what, what it is that you believe in your heart, if it's powerful enough to initiate salvation, it's powerful enough to create the supernatural. And from this day forward, you get up tomorrow morning and say, Father God, I thank you that I was healed 2,000 years ago. I thank you that my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost that I don't even have the ownership rights to it. Jesus bought the privilege to make this his home 2,000 years ago and I'm told in scripture to glorify God in my body and my spirit which are his so I don't have a choice but for this body to glorify you. Therefore anything that's in it that doesn't glorify God doesn't belong there. It's trespassing on the property of God so I thank you. I'm healed. I'm whole. I've got a sound mind. 
Do you hear what I'm saying today? Some, somebody, I, I've heard people say so many times, well, it's always something. I, I, if you're not careful, I'm going to start rebuking you. Whenever I hear, no, God have mercy. Well, it's always, it, yeah, it is always something. I can't wait to see what God is going to, if it's moving from unbelief to faith is a matter of engaging my mind to talk and move in faith and disengaging unbelief where I move from waiting to see what God is going to do into the proactive of walking and living by faith and yeah, it sure is. It's always something. The blessings of God are coming upon me, overtaking me. Do you hear what I'm saying today? It's always something exciting to see what God is going to do in our lives. Give Jesus a clap off and lose your prayer. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. This is this has become so clear to me in just recent weeks and months. I've shared with you so many times that that sounds like a, a, a verse of scripture of works. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. What it means is, without faith, you'll never live the supernatural life. That's what it means. Let me put it another way. Without faith, you're going to live a mundane life. And you'll never be able to hang with God in his level. You can step out of natural living into supernatural living today by choosing to walk and live by faith. Capturing the thoughts in your mind that have not been renewed by the living word of God and before they make their way to your mouth, you replace carnal, natural tendencies and thoughts with the living word of God so that it flows out of your mouth and God says, so will every word be that proceeds out of my mouth. And see, this is God's mouth because I dedicated it to it. Right. Listen to me. I'm not making light. This is God's mouth. That's why I don't fuss about you, complain about you, talk about you, and gossip about you. I want this to be a sanctified tongue. If my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, that means my tongue is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Do you, hear, do you hear what I'm saying? And so he said, So will the word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It will not return to me void. Or it, what it literally means is it knows no retreat. And so God said, If you will release the truth of my word as opposed to your logic and reasoning, God says, I know what it looks like, but you're either going to live by faith, by fact, or by faith. Fact says, yeah, it's bad, and you need a miracle. But faith says that the word of God that is released out of your mouth knows no retreat, but it will go and accomplish everything whereunto God is sent. So if you get up tomorrow morning and say, Father God, I thank you, my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Resurrection life, which is anti-death and anti the, the, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in this body. And the Bible says that that spirit is adequate enough. One day it's going to transform this body. But I'm also told that I'm being transformed from one level of glory to another. And if the children of Israel in the Old Testament under a worse covenant or a lesser covenant, if there was not a feeble one among them, if their clothes didn't wear out, if God kept them and preserved them under an old covenant, then I'm here to tell you my hair is going to grow back one of these days. I'm going to get my red curly locks back one of the hell up. Oh, I don't miss it. And, but, but, but listen, listen to what I'm telling you today. They that, they that wait upon the Lord, their strength is going to be renewed like that of an eagle. Do you hear what I'm saying? So when, when you send the word of God, God says that it knows no retreat. And it will accomplish the thing whereunto I've sent it. Unless you break covenant with that word, because the two have to agree together on the work on the earth. So some of you will get say, God, I thank you that I'm healed, and and you're, you're walking out by faith. Or God, I thank you that my business is flourishing. God, I thank you I've got favor at work. I know that that devil supervisor hates my guts. 
But I thank you that, that you're going to give me the supernatural favor and grace to rise above that. And that, that Ellen, you, you said that I, I'll, I'll be ahead and not the tail, above and not beneath. That's the word. So it doesn't matter who is for you or who's against you. Do you hear what I'm saying? It, 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 and so if you begin to declare the word of God and you send the word of God and you declare it by faith until fact shows up and it looks like God missed it or failed you and you cancel that word that you sent out by doubt and unbelief and unbelief is simply the act of the will choosing not to take God at his word faith is greater than fact I don't care what it looks like I've told you all years ago uh, in, in, for years in, in ministry I, I don't know it really, I think God had to have sent manna or something our way uh, to, to keep us going. But years ago, I remember, I mean, we lived, you talk about paycheck to paycheck. I mean, we, we would pray in groceries, and that was in full-time ministry. But there did come a, a, a point in, in our life. We were in a service in New Orleans, Louisiana. Is that where New Orleans is? That just didn't sound right for all of a sudden. Okay, not Nolans. And uh, we were in a service with Reinhard Bonnke. And I had been fasting and praying and seeking the face of God for a couple of years, very intensely. And our church had gone through just an explosion of a visitation of God. God moved in. I can't, I can't tell you that how deeply he changed lives irrevocably and put people into the ministry. It was just a, a sovereign visitation of God. And so we were in that service in, in uh, uh, Baton Rouge or New Orleans, Louisiana. And in that service, God imparted something to us that transformed our lives in ministry. And from that point forward, forward, God always met our needs in ministry. We evangelized on the road. And how many of you know evangelists don't do too very good? And yet here we were. Caitlin was a little baby. And we had this little car piled up in the back. And she had a little. Uh, that's because she packed everything. I, when she was two, she knew how to pack. And so, you know. But, but we're on the road for a few years evangelizing. And going all over the country preaching the gospel. And made more money on the road. than And, and I had been an evangelist for years. And barely. It's just the grace and the favor of God. But I remember the years where uh, we were out of groceries. And I think Mary Gay actually made the grocery list, wrote it out, and told God what we needed. And in it, she put ice cream bars, ice cream bars. Or it's a little pads. Eskimos, were the Eskimos? The Dove bars. Yeah, so she even wrote it down and, and wrote out and said, God, here's what we need. And gave it to the Lord. Now we were in full time ministry. And this was our case for years and years and years. We just learned. And we look back at that now. And I am so thankful to God. That he forced us to live by faith. So that we found him not to. Uh, to that I have no problem dreaming now. I, I really don't have problem. With, with dreaming and believing God. About anything whatsoever. Because we just had to develop our faith. Now understand what Peter meant when he said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith is more... Pre now I understand that. And I guess it was that, that evening that uh, she, she wrote it out, or that morning that we get take off and go to church to work and came back and there's a box of groceries on, on our doorstep with everything that we needed, including those Dove ice cream bars. <laughs> Uh, that time does it. And maybe you've had, not had to depend upon God the way we've had to depend. I like it when I have to depend upon God and I get to the point of believing God to, to because then you get to move into the supernatural. Now, where was I headed to about that? About Oh, so back years ago when it was just as tight as Mark on a tree, I told you all that uh, Mary Gay opened up the checkbook one day and it had about three more zeros to it. I think our bank account might have said seven dollars and thirteen cents, and I put seven thousand seven hundred dollars and thirteen cents. And she 
open it up and get, Freddie, what is that? I said, I'm just getting used to what it's going to look like. <laughs> I'm calling the things that are not as though they are because they already are in the mind of God. If you husbands and wives would go home and get a hold of what, of, of those fine, you, you've, been, you've been doing it the wrong way. God ain't going to bless you by using human methods. Tithe, give offerings, and then walk in agreement. Go home and put your hands on whatever that thing is and repent to God. If it's a bill that you think you can't get paid, repent to God. Say, God, I, I apologize that I've been operating in unbelief which is the lack of willingness to take God at His Word. And ask God to forgive you that you've been looking at it one-dimensionally with human logic and reasoning and say, but I commit it to you this day and I thank you that today my needs are met according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus and this is paid off. Instead of believing God for the next mortgage payment, go ahead and believe, get out of unbelief and say, God, I believe you that this mortgage is paid off. It's no coincidence that Mary Gay is using that song about believing in the supernatural. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you ask, think, or imagine according to the power of God that gets turned on inside of you. And the way the power of God gets turned on inside of you is your confession of faith. The enemy has robbed you and dangled that bounty in your face trying to convince you that, it, that he had... I, if it's your see, and, and Mary Ann, you come to my mind so many times. I expect to see her dancing. I do. I, you know, as a matter of fact, she's already looking so so much better. But I, I I believe that the glory of the Lord is going to settle upon the church, but it's not going to as long as you don't get this thing right right here. If you don't know how to work it out at home and you're trying to believe God for finances, healing, health, whatever it is, call me on the phone, husbands and wives or, or a single person. I'll, I'll talk you through how to, how to do it. Because all things, all things, all things. But pastor, you don't know how bad it is like Lazarus, if you had just said that a little while, all things. Amen. All things are all things are possible. Thank you, Lord. All things are possible. Hallelujah. All things are possible. Hallelujah. Now all things are possible. Do you hear what I'm saying? All things are all things. All things. All things are all things are possible. All things are possible if you choose to believe God, which is to step out of unbelief and stand in the faith that Jesus has given to you. I dare you to find a guinea pig, an individual that doesn't know that you're doing this, and say, God, I step out of unbelief where they're concerned and I stand in faith today and I begin to believe God on their behalf. And watch what God begins to do in their lives. Just stand, and then when God starts to do this supernatural in their midst, just stand back and give God glory. Stop complaining about it. Just find some guinea pigs. It might be a husband, it might be a wife, it might be a child. Get out of unbelief. Call the things that are not as though they are. You want a wonderful marriage? Say, Father God, I thank you. You gave me a dead, dead husband. Because Lazarus must have lived a supernatural life after he came out of the dead. So I thank you for resurrecting my dead husband who did romantically or whatever the case may be. Do you hear what I'm saying today? I'll begin to focus your faith. I feel faith flowing today. And I declare that all things are possible if you just believe. Which means stop disbelieving God and just say, God, I believe you. How are you going to do it? You're going to open your mouth and say, Father God, I thank you for elevation at work. I thank you that my office is going to get expanded and I'm going to get a raise without much more headache associated with it. I thank you for a healed marriage that is full of passion and love and blessings overflowing. Do you hear what I'm saying? Are you agreeing with me today? All things are possible if you dare to believe God and to take Him at His word. Stay with me this morning. Hallelujah.